question is this, right now you feel good. There is no way you could feel anything but good. But what we want to look at is what can we do to make certain we feel good next week, next month, next year. In other words, how can we keep it going? How can we be up uh, most of the time and on when we need to? Now I'm going to put a lot of emphasis uh, in this session along the lines of the fact that you can have everything in life you want if you will just help enough other people get what they want. And what we're going to do, ladies and gentlemen, is we're going to work with a formula. We're going to give you some steps and procedures which absolutely will make a permanent difference in your life. I would like to remind you that we touched on the first step in our last session when I said to you the first thing you want to do is you want to claim these qualities of life. You want to simply adopt them as being yours. You want to do everything you can on a steady basis to develop those qualities further and further and further. Step number two, if you want to be up most of the time and on when you need to be, if you want to build that winning attitude, then you need to be a good finder. I'm going to stray from what a lot of people believe is the norm in life. The old look out for me first and then if there's anything left, you can have it approach to life. As I indicated earlier, we teach a seminar in Dallas called Born to Win. People do come from everywhere. A couple of years ago, we had a major corporation to send in four couples. Now, we encourage people to come uh, with their mates if they are married. Uh, but uh, it is not a marriage seminar, though we've seen a lot of husbands and wives walk in at each other's throats and walk out in each other's arms because we did fit them with those new glasses, because we did teach them how to communicate. Again, a lot of people really do think that when they take turns talking, that's communication, and that really is not. Well, in this three days, I lecture twice a day, but most of the time is spent around a round table with six other people. There's a lot of individual instruction. There's a great deal of individual participation. Somebody has rightly said that if you hear it, you forget it. If you see it, you remember it. But if you see it and hear it and do it, you understand and then you're successful. That's the reason we like to get you involved. It's the doing that makes the difference. Again, you got to be before you can do. You got to do before you can have. Well, these four couples came uh, to our Born to Win seminar, and uh, we had them really involved. When we have these people around those round tables, every time anybody says anything or does anything, the other six people write them a little note, and it says, I like Jane Jones because. And then they give some specific observable behavior because she is so pleasant and gives me encouragement. At work, you could say something like, uh, I like Bill Smith because he brings his projects in on time and under budget. But at the seminar, at the end of it, each person there has got between 50 and sometimes as many as 150 of those little slips. And they, they literally keep them for months, sometimes even years. Well, the first night, these four couples went out to a late dinner at one of Dallas's finest and certainly one of our most expensive restaurants. They hit the jackpot with a waiter. I mean, he was absolutely magnificent. He had been there over 20 years, been a waiter over 25 years. He was totally professional in every aspect of his job. He was there when he was needed, but he did not join the party. When there was a need, he filled it and disappeared, and he could anticipate those needs. He really was great. When and they got his name, and when they got ready to leave, they left him a 25% tip, which is significant, I hasten to add. They also left, each one of them did, that is, one of those little I like because slips. 
They walked out the front door. They had gotten about 100 feet, 150 feet from the front door when they heard the waiter's voice from the rear. He was calling to them, wait a minute, folks, wait a minute. They looked and there he was. And as he ran to them, he was waving those eight slips of paper. He drew a breast and he stopped. He said, you know, folks, I've been a waiter over 25 years. Then they said he broke down and literally could not say a thing for what seemed like forever. When he finally regained his composure, he said, in 25 years, this is by far the most significant thing that has ever happened to me. He said, I will never forget tonight. And with that, he turned and walked back in the restaurant. Never a word about the tip, just about those little eight slips of paper. My good friend Calvert Robert from Phoenix, Arizona, says there are over three billion people on the face of this earth who go to bed hungry every night. But he says there are over four billion people on the face of this earth who go to bed hungry every night for a word of praise and appreciation of love, of hope, of affection, of encouragement. Wouldn't it be tragic if one of those people was your wife or your husband or your mom or your dad, your son or your daughter? Or for that matter, Someone with whom you work every day of your life. A nice person, a nice lady, a nice guy who on the surface seems to have everything going their way, but deep down they're in turmoil. And a word of encouragement, of consideration, of kindness, of affection. What a dramatic difference it could make in their lives. And it would only take a moment. Yes, words of encouragement can make such a dramatic difference in someone's life. Three years ago, I spoke down in Melbourne, Australia. During one of the breaks, a, a lady came up to me and, and she said, Mr. Ziegler, I'm 32 years old. She said, I have two little girls. They're six years old and they're nine years old. They've had psychological problems like you absolutely cannot believe, including a reversion to infantile behavior. She said, I got your tapes on raising those positive kids. And she said, in one of them, you say, tell your kids that you love them. But she said, Mr. Ziegler, in my 32 years of life, there's never been a living, breathing human being who said to me, I love you. But in your tape, you just kept saying, tell your kids that you love them. And she said, as a matter of fact, it was weird because it seemed every time I would put that particular tape in, it was always on that exact spot. If you don't tell your kids that you love them, they're going to grow up and get married and have kids and, and they won't tell their kids that they love them and somebody's got to break the chain. She said, one night we were seated in our den I was on one side of the room. My six-year-old was literally at my feet. My nine-year-old was across the room. And all of a sudden, she said, I remembered. And she said, I just more or less blurted it out. Uh, girls, I just want you to know I sure do love you. She said, had my six-year-old been on a spring, she could not have gotten up any faster. She was like a shot out of a gun. She threw her arms around me and hugged me and kissed me and started crying. And my nine-year-old across the way ran across and she threw her arms around me and she hugged me and she kissed me and, and she started crying. And of course, by then, I was crying too. She said, Mr. Ziegler, I have no idea how long we cried. Might just have been a moment or two, but it might have been five, even ten minutes. She said, all I know is that when we finished crying, that those tears had washed away a lot of the hurt and the pain and the bitterness even that had crept into our lives. And though I was emotionally exhausted, there was a, an exhilaration that is impossible to describe, a feeling that I'd never had before in my life. 
She said, the girls and I promised each other that night that never again would we let a day go by that we didn't start that day and end that day by hugging and kissing and declaring our love. She said, you know, Mr. Ziegler, you would have thought that under the emotions of the moment, the circumstances that were there, you would have thought that it would have been easy and natural, but you know, when we got away from the emotion of that moment, we started thinking about it. I felt awkward the next morning. She said, I'm just so grateful that I was mature enough to understand that if you always wait until you feel like doing things, you will never really get them done. And so she said, though it was awkward at first, because you cannot make an overdraft on the bank of love all of your life, and then bring that account up to date in one deposit. I don't care how big the deposit is, but the next morning, awkwardly, I grabbed my little girls again. I hugged them and kissed them, told them how much I loved them, and they told me the same thing. Took us a couple of weeks before it even approached being natural. At the end of the month, though, we were adding an occasional hug and kiss extra, and Mr. Ziegler, within 60 days, we just used any excuse for the hugging and kissing. And Mr. Ziegler, within 90 days, 98% of all of those psychological problems had disappeared. 2,000 years ago, a Jewish scholar wrote a love letter to his relatives in Corinth. Some say it's the most beautiful love letter ever written. Uh, he kind of summed it up by saying, love never fails. I was interested to note that when you chose those qualities of success, you put loving in there because it is so important. I take you back to the story of the waiter. Now, I got a couple of points I want to make uh, with that story. Well, one of them just kind of cute. At least I think it's cute. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you have just loved to have been at the next table that waiter served? Man, don't you know they got service like nobody has ever gotten before in their life. But the real reason I tell the story, the major point I want to make is the very heart of everything we do. And that simply is this philosophy that you can have everything in life you want if you will just help enough other people get what they want. Why, the next morning when those eight people came in, and remember now the waiter said it was the most meaningful event of his entire career, but you should have seen those eight people the next morning. They were so high we had to pull them down off the ceiling before we could bring them into the room. They bought a case of those little I like because pads because they want to give them to everybody. It really does work. And you know, I can almost, I'm not a mind reader, but I know where some of your thinking is. You might sit there and say, well, Zeke, I can see where it would work for that lady in Melbourne, Australia. Those were kids. I can see where it would work with that waiter because after all, the reality is he got a bigger tip because he did such a job. But Zeke, you got to understand, man, I work on Main Street. I deal with Wall Street. This outfit I work with, man, they're bottom line. Can you use this philosophy in the cold-blooded, hard-headed business world in which we live. My friend, it works better there than anywhere else. In the December 1987 issue of Executive Excellence, a publication of 16 pages, which has a lot of very concise and pertinent articles in it. There was an article in it by Dr. Ken Blanchard, and Dr. Blanchard was, or is, the man of one-minute manager fame. And Dr. Blanchard reported on a study which had been done concerning investing in the Dow Jones, and here's what he said. Had you put $30,000 30 years ago in the Dow Jones, right across the board, the composite, he said today you would have in excess of $100,000.
But he said, had you taken the same $30,000 and invested it in the 21 companies which have ethics as the base from which they operate these qualities right here, ethics, the base from which they operate, plus they have an announced public policy that the reason they're in business is to serve the public. You can have everything in life you want. You'll just help enough other people get what they want. Today you'd have over one million dollars. Same article. Same article. He reports on a study done by Arizona State University of the companies which have paid dividends for the last 100 years. Now, folks, that's financial stability, if there's ever been financial stability. And these companies have ethics as the base from which they operate and an announced public policy that the reason they're in business is to serve the public. It's absolutely true. You can have everything in life you want if you'll just help enough other people get what they want. So step number two, if you really want to keep that attitude right, if you really want to build that career, and if you really want to do the things in life that will make you successful, become a good finder. Now, incidentally, folks, you know, again, I'm not a mind reader, but I know sometimes when people sit there in seminar, you get to thinking, well, I don't know if I want to do all that. Like this idea of standing in front of the mirror and claiming all of those qualities. I'd be a little self-conscious, Ziegler, if I did that. Now, I'll look at them from time to time, but to go through that rigmarole you're talking about, ah, I don't know about that. Friend, let me ask you a question. What have you got to lose? Nobody's even going to know about it but you. But suppose it does what I'm telling you it will do. Wouldn't it be tragic if you chose not to take a simple suggestion that would make a dramatic change in your life? Claim the qualities, number one. Number two, become a good finder. Number three, you need to get an education. One of the things that I do in our company when we bring someone new aboard, at the moment we have about 80 people, and when we bring someone aboard, I like to spend a little time talking with them to let them know what they can expect from us and kind of to find out what we can expect from them, kind of to get to know that individual. Recently, we had a beautiful lady to join us after she had been uh, on a... Uh, uh, vacation for 23 years. Now, those of you who are mothers will say, Ziegler, that wasn't a vacation. Seriously, she had uh, raised her children. Now she was re-entering re the workplace and she was starting back and you can understand why she would be a little apprehensive. And incidentally, I understand raising kids is not a vacation, and I would never even mildly imply that. But now she's shifting gears, and as she came in, the first question she asked me was, do you discriminate because of a lack of education? And I said, well, we certainly do. She looked a little stunned and obviously disappointed. But I said, we never discriminate because of a lack of schooling. Now there's a dramatic difference in the two. You see, you can finish school, and I definitely think you should. You can even make it easy, and I definitely think you should not. But you can never finish your education, and it is never easy. It's something that goes on and on and on. I'm absolutely convinced that there is literally no excuse in America today for anybody not to have a brilliant education if you can even read at the fifth grade level. And if you cannot read at the fifth grade level, go to your public library. They can put you in touch with the people who are teaching illiterates how to read in most every case. Once you've gotten turned on to what it can mean to you, I believe you'll do it. There's no excuse for not being brilliantly educated. All you need to do is three 
very simple things. Number one, you should learn one new word every day. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that's not an earth-shattering task. Reader's Digest has an article every month or a page in there. It pays to enrich your word power. One new word a day in five years, you can talk to just about anybody about just about anything. Not because you know a whole lot of big words, but because they have broadened your base. It's gone broader and deeper. And you see, every time you learn a new word, that word's got a couple of buddies. And those buddies have got buddies. You learn one new word today, and in five years, I'll absolutely guarantee you, it will make a difference. One study involving 1,361 executives revealed, and these are top-level executives, real, uh, revealed that they had outstanding vocabularies. Vince Roberts lives in Ottawa, Canada. Now, Vince was 37 years old. He had a fifth grade education. He was a cab driver. And he literally spent hours every week at the airport waiting on a fare. He spent hours every week at the hotels waiting on a fare. And then one day, something happened in Vince Roberts' life. I do not know what it was, but something happened. He became inspired. He realized that he did not have to stay like he was or where he was, so he bought himself a book. The book he bought was a dictionary a 20-pound dictionary. And starting on page one, word for word for word, he went all the way through that 20-pound dictionary twice. He ended up owning the cab company. He ended up investing in the stock market, becoming a very wealthy man. Today, he travels telling people how you did it. How he did it. Now, my friend, there is no excuse on earth. There's no reason why you cannot learn at least one new word every day, and it absolutely will make a difference. Step number two, in order to get that education, you need to read at least 20 minutes every day. Now, I spend about two hours a day or more but you got to understand, this is my business. This is my life. This is my profession. i got to do it. Fortunately, I just absolutely love to do it. But 20 minutes a day will make a dramatic difference. Now, obviously, I'm talking about reading something good, powerful, positive, biographies, autobiographies, self-help books, motivational books, books about your business, your profession, the industry of which you are a part, books about human nature, how to deal with people. If you are an average reader, that's 220 words a minute, if you will just read 20 minutes a day, at the end of the year you will have read 20 200-page books. That is 18 more than the average American reads in a year's time. That will give you a colossal advantage in whatever it is that you're doing. And folks, the reality is just a little advantage is all most of us need. It's the little things that make the big difference in life. You call a girl a kitten, she'll absolutely love you. Call her a cat. You got a problem, friend, a bad problem. If you say she's a vision, you score all kind of points. Call her a sight, you're in trouble. Uh, fellows, can you imagine you look in your wife's eyes and say, Honey, when I look into your eyes, the wheels of time just stand still. Oh, that's beautiful. That's poetry. But can you imagine what will happen if you look her in the eyes and say, You know, honey, when I look into your eyes, the wheel, the, the, when I look into your eyes, I just am reminded that you got a face that stop a clock. I mean, ladies and gentlemen, that is something that would make a difference. It's the little things that make a big difference. If my watch is four hours wrong, no problem. But if it's four minutes wrong, I'm in trouble. Because, you see, I'm scheduled to leave this afternoon at 345. 
If it's four minutes slow and I get there at 349, well, you can see the problem. Because I made a deal with the airlines that if I'm not there, when they get ready to go, that they're just to go ahead without me. And as far as I know, they've always lived up to their end of the agreement. They did it last year in Dallas. I can say that. Little things make a big difference in life. The third thing you need to do to get that brilliant education is you need to regularly listen to cassettes when you're in your automobile. For example, the average salesman, according to my friend Don Hudson, spends 510 hours a year in his automobile. <laughs> While you're in that car, and the average person, incidentally, I was a visiting scholar at the University of Southern California for two years, and they did a study which revealed that if you live in a metropolitan area and drive 12,000 miles a year, that in three years' time, you can acquire the equivalent of two years of college education while you're in your automobile. You can literally learn everything from Chinese art and a foreign language to the Bible, to financial planning, to goal setting, to how to close a sale, to how to communicate more effectively. There are hundreds of things that you can learn in your automobile. It ought to be the greatest educational institution literally in the world. You spend $10,000, $15,000, $20,000, $30,000, even $40,000 in a car. And yet the typical American, let me tell you what they do, they stomp their foot and gripe and groan and complain. Every time the traffic gets a little heavy, they see a jam up front and they say, daggone it all, when are they going to do something about this? When they ought to, when they see a traffic jam saying, oh boy, I bet it's going to take me 30 minutes to get through that sucker and in 30 minutes I can learn three new words, I can learn two new causes, I can learn about financial planning. That's what I'm talking about, using the time that you have. You got to go anyhow. Why not get an education while you're on the way? And that won't take one minute of your time. Incidentally, folks, when you talk about time, let me remind you that 72% of the time when we're watching television, we're watching something we have no interest in. Uh, we rush home to see a particular show, The Cosby Show. Wonderful show. I've already seen it twice. It is a good show. But a lot of times people will mash a button and change the channel and watch on the other one. And four hours later they say, boy, I can't believe I spent the whole night here doing nothing. I'm talking about utilizing your time. So step number three is get an education. Step number four, if you really want to go to the top, you want to maintain that attitude you need to learn how to say hello. You need to know how to greet people properly, whether it's in person or whether it's in the on the phone. Now, I do something and have been doing it a long time. Regardless of what time of day it is, when I greet people, I always say, good morning. And whether it's 9 o'clock in the morning or 9 o'clock at night, they always respond in 85% of the cases, that is, they'll say, good morning. Now, a lot of times, after they said it, they'll say, it's not morning. And I'll say, why did you say good morning then? They said, I said it because you said it. I said, that's right. That brings out something very important, ladies and gentlemen, and that's this. When you go out in life to find friends, they're very scarce. When you go out to be a friend, they're everywhere. What you send out is what you get back. If you complain because people in a certain area or building were not very friendly, can you honestly say that you initiated in the friendliness yourself? Send it out and you will get it back. Greet people enthusiastically, whether it's in person or on the telephone. Uh, now, I challenge you to do this. When this seminar is over, go get your yellow pages out. Look up 10 numbers. Swap with one of your buddies who's got 10 numbers and dial those 10 numbers and I'll guarantee you no more than 3 out of the 10 can, can you identify what the name of that business is. You really cannot. They snatch the phone off the hook as if it were an intrusion. What do you mean all this number? I wouldn't bother you. Good morning every little company. And you have no more idea than a goat who you have called. I challenge you. Call us in Dallas, 214-233-9191.
Got a watch number, but it'll do you more good. Spend your own dollar. Call us down there, and our lady will pick up that telephone, and with considerable enthusiasm, she'll say, Good morning! Now, a lot of people say, Ziegler, is it always a good morning? It sure is. And if you don't believe it, you just try missing one of them. <laughs> then she makes a little motivational speech. She says, it's a great day at Zig Ziegler's. My, and this is Shirley, may I help you? There are 11 words involved. It takes four to five seconds to do that. It will save you an average of nine seconds because nobody ever says, how'd you say it was? Which company is this? Where are you? They've gotten the communication very clearly. Now, when I'm at home, and I do stress this is when I'm at home, when I answer the telephone, I answer it many times singing, oh, good morning to you. Now, I'll be the first to admit sometimes there's a long pause. <laughs> A lot of times I'll sing, if you don't speak up, I'm going to hang up. And they'll say, who is this? I'll say, whoever you want. Who do you want? Man, you sure do feel good today. I say, yeah, many years ago, I decided I was going to feel good today. Good friend of mine, before his tragic death, Dr. John Kozak, a brilliant young psychiatrist, told me that over 90% of the way we feel is determined by the decision we make as to how we want to feel and how we expect to feel. There are 51 diseases which are psychosomatic in origin. Answer it with enthusiasm. A lot of times I'll pick up the phone, I'll just say, Heidi, Heidi, Heidi. Now, my favorite way of answering the phone at home, good morning, this is Gene Ziegler's happy husband. Now, I do it for two reasons. Number one, it's the truth. And number two, fellas, you just can't believe how many points I score with that redhead when I answer that telephone that way. And I love to score points with a redhead. Now, when one of my grandchildren are around, I have two that are the right age for this. One of them is named Sunshine for obvious reasons. The other one is named Keeper. Now, you know, when a fisherman pulls in a good one, he's got a keeper. And so when we first saw her, we knew we had a keeper, and that's where the name comes from. If one of them are around, I'll pick up the telephone and I'll say, Good morning, this is Sunshine's proud granddaddy. Those little eyes just light up and think of what that does to her self-image. One day, Keeper was over at the house. She and I had been uh, talking up in my office. The redhead was down in the den. And I, then Keeper left me and went downstairs. And I had to ask the redhead something. So I just picked up the phone and dialed her. And Keeper picked up the telephone. She said, good morning. This is Mamaw's happy, happy granddaughter. <laughs> I'll tell you, ladies and gentlemen, these kids really, really get with the program. They follow the model, which is that. And you might say, well, Zig, now, why? Why do you do this? Well, let me tell you something, folks. I do it because, again, you cannot separate your personal life from your family life and from your business life. We were very fortunate early on. We discovered that kids go where there's excitement. They stay where there is love. There has never been a generation in our nation's history that is as starved for affection and intimacy as is this current generation. And they are not getting it, and that is one of the reasons they turn to drugs and promiscuity. The reason they get involved in gangs and some of the vandalism that takes place. We discovered that if their love was there and the excitement was there, that other kids would come play in our den and living room. Our children's friends wanted to, out of curiosity, what kind of people are they up there that answer the telephone that way? So they would come up. Sometimes we had a traffic jam, but I would prefer 14 of those kids in our den and us know everything going on than to have my child somewhere else and have no idea of what was happening. Now, I kind of hit the jackpot again in this. The redhead is affectionately known as the happy hugger. Uh, if it's moving, she will stop it and hug it. And if it is not moving, she'll dust it off and sell it. So <clears throat> when these kids... When these kids would come in, the redhead would grab them and give them that hug. In many cases, that was the only hug they had gotten since the last time they had been there. 
It creates an amazing environment by answering the phone that way. Parents, I challenge you to do this. If the telephone rings and your daughter is standing uh, or sitting around, mom, just pick up that telephone and with a big grin on your face and a lot of enthusiasm, say, good morning, this is Molly's proud mom. Dad, if you're there and the phone rings, you pick up that telephone and you say, Good morning, this is Paul's proud pop. And you might have that old gawky, gawkly, gangly 15-year-old boy standing there and he might say, Oh, Dad! <laughs> but I'll guarantee you, the next time the phone rings, he will wait for you to answer <laughs> it. It is the ultimate compliment. When one of my grandchildren are over there, they never answer the telephone. They go to the telephone, but they wait for me to answer that telephone. I can tell you it'll do wonders for their self-image. Dad, let me talk to you just for a moment. Dr. Ross Campbell says this. <clears throat> he says the average little six-year-old boy has only gotten one sixth as much hugging and kissing as says the average little six-year-old girl. And in the first grade, little boys get in nine times as much trouble, or nine times as likely, rather, to have a speech difficulty as are little girls. Dr. Campbell said that in all of his years of research and all of his years of practice, he has never known a single human being with a sexual dysfunction who had a father who was gentle and affectionate and compassionate and loving and kind and some of those other feminine qualities. There's still a bunch of those macho men who say, I ain't going to kiss my little boy and make a sissy out of him. The absolute opposite is true. The kids are starved for skin. They want hugging. They want to know that you care. And fellas, I'll say the same thing about your wives. Let me tell you something. They resent it when you ignore them all day and then give them your undivided attention when the lights go out. And as a practical matter, I'll just flat tell you, if you gripe about the mashed potatoes at supper or dinner, all you're going to get the rest of the evening is cold shoulder. Your relationship. I believe we are hungry all over this land for people who are willing to hug when hug is all they're interested in. Step number four, learn to greet people in person. If somebody asks you, how you doing, uh, instead of the old negatives that you often hear, well, fine since it's Friday. Or good since I get off in 20 minutes. Or great since it's payday. And don't you love it when there's some people, as my good friend Roy Hatton says, when they pull themselves up to their full height and say, well, under the circumstances. I mean, it makes you wonder what they're doing under there in the first place, doesn't it? <laughs> now, the next time somebody asks you how you're doing, why don't you just tell them the truth? Why don't you say outstanding? but I'm improving, or super good, but I'll get better. And you might say, but see, suppose I'm not doing super good. Am I telling the truth? Of course you're telling the truth. You're just telling it in advance, that's all. <laughs> Why wait on the good stuff? Claim it now, enjoy it now. Step number six, to build that winning attitude, we need to shape up, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sorry, you know what I just did? I skipped step number five. Hey, don't want to do that. That. Step number five, cancel that one. As we'd say down home, some folks could file up a two-car parade. And so let's back up to step number five. For 27 hours a year, you do something that's kind of neat that we have to do. You know, negative Americans amaze me, and yet so many of them are so negative, they call those electrical appliances on the street corners red lights or stop lights or traffic lights. But they really are put there to make traffic go. 
So the reality is they are Goliaths. Now let me ask you a question. Have you ever been at one of those Goliaths and you're going to spend 27 hours a year incidentally waiting on the right color and you're sitting there waiting on the right color to come along. You're all excited. You're all enthused. You're highly motivated. You're listening to your Zig Ziglar tapes. And you look out the side of your eye and you can't believe what you're seeing. Here sits a guy over here and he's waiting on the right color to come along but he's got a good firm grip on that steering wheel. I I mean, he doesn't want that car to go anywhere. Got his mouth fixed exactly right just in case he has to talk to that thing. And you can't believe it. You're watching him. He's got his foot on the accelerator. He's racing the engine trying to change the color of the light. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have actually ever seen some dodo sitting there racing a car motor trying to change the color of the light? Can I see your hand, please? <laughs> Folks, I hate to be negative. Matter of fact, I won't be negative. I'll be like a little boy came home from school one day and said, Dad, I'm afraid I flunked that arithmetic test. His dad said, Son, that's negative. Be positive. He said, Dad, I'm positive I flunked that arithmetic <laughs> test. I'm absolutely positive that by racing that car motor, you're not going to change the color of that light. Now, there was no while, and I know we got some very prominent, enormously successful people watching this, and some of them are very sophisticated, and I know some of them say, well, I certainly uh, would not say super good, but I'll get better, or outstanding, but I'm improved. I just wouldn't say things like that. That's a little amateurish. That's even a little juvenile. Well, friend, if you think it's juvenile to say super good, but I'll get better, just what do you think it is to sit there and race that car motor trying to change the color of the light? Now, that's just not going to work. Good friend of mine, Bernie Lotzik in Winnipeg, Canada, is really more a brother. Bernie is the most positive human being I've ever seen. He's so positive he's never had a cold. Once in a great while, he has a warm. Uh, he's so positive he won't even talk about the weekend. He says that's negative. He calls it the strong end. And, and you might say, now come on, Ziegler, you got to be kidding me. Super good, strong ends, go lights, uh, all of that kind of stuff. Is that necessary? No, you can be mediocre without it. <laughs> mediocre? Who does that dude think he's talking to? I'm the president of my own company. Mediocre? I'm worth over $10 million. Mediocre? Why, I have uh, led the nation in sales every year for the last three years. Mediocre? I've got two PhDs. Well, bully for you. I still say mediocre because success is not measured by what you've done compared to what somebody else has done. You might have 10 times the ability they have. Success, real success is measured by what you've done with the ability you have. Compared